Welcome, everyone. We are honored to spend the next 45 minutes or so with you here today. Uh, my name is Laura Hernandez. I'm a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute, and I have the absolute privilege of moderating this important discussion today on scaling up deeper learning as a means to advance equity and transformation in, U in our school system. And I'm joined today by a distinguished group of educational system leaders and equity warriors who will attest to the challenges and the opportunities to growing and sustaining deeper learning, particularly in the precarious times that we find ourselves in. So today we will hear from Lydia Dobbins, the president and CEO of New Tech Network. We're also joined by Susan Enfield, the superintendent of Highline Public Schools in Washington State. We also have Anthony Smith, the superintendent of Winton Woods City Schools in Ohio. And last but not least, we have Carlos Moreno, the co-executive director of Big Picture Learning and the recently named Innovator of Color by this conveners or Innovator of Color in 2020 by the conveners of this virtual summit. So a special congratulations to him. Um, each of these leaders has led and supported efforts that have managed the feat of sustaining and scaling up deeper learning, which has been a remained, a, has remained, excuse me, an elusive goal for decades. And so they have a wealth of knowledge and expertise, and I'm grateful to them for sharing that with us today. For folks on the line, just a quick note, there is a chat function that attendees are welcome to use during our discussion today. Um, but there's also a targeted space for you to add any questions for the Q&A portion of our discussion that we hope to get to later on in the panel. So without further ado, let's dig right in. We're here today to talk deeper learning, which is a highly used in vogue phrase in the education world. And with that, actually many people hold different meanings around what it looks like and what it actually means. So I wanted to set the stage by discussing what deeper learning means and what it looks like in practice. So at a 30,000 foot level, deeper learning refers to teaching and learning practices that enable students to learn academic content and apply their knowledge in authentic ways. Um, it allows young people to explore their interests and learn content in personalized ways and ultimately to think critically as they solve complex problems. And obviously in the dynamic process of learning, students are able to develop their ability to collaborate with others, to effectively communicate, to be self-directed in their learning, um, which also eventually will help them learn and persevere. So Lydia, I'm going to go ahead and start with you because I just said a lot there about the aims and scope of deeper learning. But what does deeper learning actually then look like in practice? Uh, yes, and, I, and because we have so much to cover, I'm going to yeah. sort of quickly add a little bit to that, Laura. I think um, three important concepts, um, relational, relational, relational. It's got to feel relevant to students. Uh, it reintroduces the entire notion of what a, the role adults play in facilitating learning, and it actually uh, reorients every aspect of a school system and, and by extension a district to focus on learning rather than the sort of the more what is often referred to as the sort of traditional notion of factory learning or having all students experience the same thing and somehow uh, meet their needs. So it it is in a word reimagining what uh, school can be to actually place students in learning and and mastering learning in relevant ways. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Lydia. Susan, what would you add about deeper learning and how that looks like at sites in Highline Public Schools? Yeah, so actually I would go back to my early days as a high school teacher down in Silicon Valley at Homestead High School. I was the high school newspaper um, advisor. And, you know, in, in my uh, years in education, one of the greatest examples where I think we see kids really, young people really being able to express themselves and put the, the best of their critical thinking and problem solving and collaboration skills on, on display is when they can publish their work and have to stand by it, good or bad. And um, you know how, and I, it is not impossible to create those kinds of opportunities for students that are not in a journalism classroom or are not at a new tech high uh, school. So, you know, whether it's having our students prepare, you know, mock trials that they put on before city council members and other people, you know, how are we helping our students see the connection between what they're learning from an academic content perspective and what they actually can do with it? Uh, and, and I really do think it's um, making sure that we're equipping our students to be, you know, we always say critical thinkers. I want them to be critical consumers. 
um, in every way, shape or form, but especially of information and quote unquote news. Um, and to be able to really think critically and know how to take any issue challenge and approach it both from an individual problem solving perspective and from a collaborative problem solving perspective. And if we can equip them with those skills, they'll succeed in whatever path it is they choose for themselves. But but we will not help we will not equip them to succeed on whatever path they choose for themselves unless we give them that, regardless how good how good the academic academic content is. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Susan. And so we hear deeper learning supports all of these kind of competencies around students. It helps them become critical consumers. I love that, Susan. Um, also the relational nature of it. The question that I want to raise, Carlos, and I want to turn to you on this one, is why is deeper learning then an equity issue? Because that's how we often talk about it. So why is all of this something that we should be concerned with if we are thinking about equity advancement in schools? Yeah, thanks for that, Laura. And, and it's, as I had shared before we, we were on the air, it's just great to be in conversation with friends in the work and in the struggle. So it feels like a family conversation. So I'll can just be as we as we always do, just be very real about it. It's, it's because everything is an equity issue. And everything is an equity issue because we're dealing with systemic issues that have been entrenched in our country and in our communities and in our classrooms for well over a century. And Laura, in your opening, you said it, I think perfectly, deeper learning is still received as this in vogue phrase in the education world. Um, we've seen countless times um, just before, just whether it's the adoption of smart boards, the move toward block scheduling, even approaches to standardized test prep, that whatever is considered in vogue at that time typically gets adopted by resource rich communities before it trickles down to underserved communities. And what's not talked about as much is the fact that those same communities um, that that have that and when they realize that it's no longer th those trendy practices are also more quickly discarded by those same communities when it's clear that they're not as effective as they had hoped. And then they linger in underserved communities well past their expiration date. Mm -hmm. um, now, I will not say that that's true of deeper learning. Um, my organization, Big Picture Learning, always got to put in a plug, right? So it's proud <laughs> to be part of what we would call the deeper learning movement but we haven't changed our practices to align ourselves with the concept of deeper learning. Deeper learning for us as a term came to us and one that we believe in and support. But when it comes to equity and deeper learning, we see it as our responsibility to use our experience and our influence to make sure that it is equitably made available as an option to schools and communities who may wish to adopt it as an approach, especially those communities that have historically and continue to be kept furthest from opportunity. Mm -hmm. Anthony, I'd love for you to chime in with your own thoughts around kind of how deeper learning access or spread has been an issue in your district in Whitten Woods. Well, you know, we've, we've talked about this, this notion about the academic gaps and performance gaps. And I think Carlos said it best, it's the opportunity. If you're not giving young people the opportunity to share, because they do come with a wealth, wealth of knowledge, we assume that they don't, because maybe that knowledge does not compare with ours. And I think that what we have to do is be able to push the envelope to figure out who determines who gets the deeper opportunities and who makes that decision. And sometimes that decision and the panel can tell you it's based on popularity. It's based on who my parents know. It's based on how the teacher feels about me and how she looks at my brown skin as opposed to my other you know, colleagues in the classroom. So I, I think every one of the panelists hit, hit a home run on this one because you know, Lydia mentioned the relationships. Well, if you don't believe in me, how do you take me to a deeper dive and get me to really express that I have some other sentiment and values about this educational juggernaut that we talk about without giving me the opportunity? You don't, you limit me because you make assumptions about me. And once you make those assumptions, you know, if you put a young person in the classroom, you make the assumptions about me, I will play those out to make your assumptions come true. And so it's all about the opportunities and putting the young people in front of something that's going to be a little more challenging and something that's real. And then how do we cultivate it and make it come to life? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Anthony. And, and 
it's a perfect segue to our next question because our next question is really going to focus on why, if we know deeper learning works, we know it's rich, we know it, it really enables people or young people to be empowered and learn in really rich ways. Why isn't it a reality in most schools? And I'm hearing in what you're saying, Anthony, that a lot around mindsets and assumptions around is particularly students of color or students from low income backgrounds or other marginalized groups. There are a lot of those assumptions around it. Um, but Lydia, I would love to get your additional take on what other factors do you think are playing into the fact that deeper learning is not more of a reality in U.S. schools? Well, we might have to start with <laughs> the most fundamental notion that people don't agree on what school ought to be, nor are we willing to agree on how far from that ideal school is for far too many kids on a daily basis and for the adults involved too. You know, there, there are no enemies in this, <laughs> but we have become, uh, it's become such a toxic topic that the idea that school's broken or that we don't know what to do. And I think if anything, the wealth of success and everyone on this panel can speak to that, we no longer have to think of this as an ideal state. It really, be, and COVID, I would hope this year, more than anything between the disruption that COVID has caused and now uh, increasingly the calls for uh, racial equity and social justice, we could perhaps agree there's more not working and, and let's agree on the problem to solve for. And we don't need to invent something that hasn't been invented. We need to turn to things that work and then steady a course and and that means change and that means being willing and able to start with the problem we're trying to solve in honest difficult painful <laughs> conversations uh, and then embark on a journey which is not fast and not overnight we we still tend to want something we can install and have working in five minutes i know i I could go on if you give me the platform, but I, I want to leave room for, for other voices. <laughs> Absolutely. Susan Carlos, if you have anything to add, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I would I would say one big issue is a lack of trust. A lack of trust that our students are capable, getting back to Carlos's point, the the fact that so many of us as educators bring our own biases and belief systems about who can and who can't, about what our children should be doing, should not be doing. Um, and I think, so I think fundamentally it's to what, to what degree do the adults trust our young people to go and do this level of independent, meaningful work, knowing that if it is authentic, if it is real, there could be blowback, right? But that's the real world. Like that's where it gets good. Right? Like there you, now you're really doing something. Um, and so I do think it's a lack of trust. And I also think it is, um, and, and I don't have the answer to this, but how do we ensure that we are, you know, as we say in Highline, knowing every student by name, strength and need, having that level of personalization and depth of knowledge of a student so that they can then go do, engage in deeper learning and guaranteeing that regardless of your zip code and what school your child is assigned to, you are going, your child will have the same rich, high quality learning experience. I don't think we've been able to reconcile personalization and deeper learning with, with consistency and a guarantee of quality across schools. That I think is fundamentally what we have to figure out how to do. And, and, and it doesn't, and we try to standardize it with standards and tests and all that, and it doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. Doesn't mean there isn't a place for, you know, standards, metrics, et cetera, but we have not cracked that nut. And until we do, we won't see deeper learning scale to the degree that we would all like it to be and that we know is possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On that point, um, I do want to turn to a more, I mean, we've talked a bit about the challenges that are obviously embedded in our cultures and our systems that will prevent deeper learning. But we do have folks, all of you on the call have managed to actually grow and sustain deeper learning models across the country and in different regions. So Carlos, I'd love for you to jump in um, speaking about your work with big picture learning, um, you've been able to make deeper learning models that are interest driven, interest based, happen in cities and regions around the country. How have you all managed that feed over your long history? Yeah, uh, actually, before I do that, I just wanted to add to the, the, the previous conversation really quickly. I, sure. I, I, I would second everything that Lydia and Susan shared about those, some of those challenges and the resistors and, and that 
I have sat in meetings with chief, chief executives of major districts where we kind of had to you know, chop it up and talk about our design, our model, and they're periodically, they're, I, I, we would hear back, that sounds very hard to do. And my mom was like, yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is hard to do, but it's exactly what's necessary um, if we are going to truly educate our young people in the original definition, and I don't mean to get biblical, but the biblical definition of it, which is to lift up our young people and raise them up. So I just needed to note that oftentimes one of the resistors that we often hear is that it is difficult to do. Um, and that's not, that's just not good enough. Um, to your, your question, Laura, I'm sorry, I, I needed to go there for a minute. Yeah, do um, do. Just to be honest, we, we have had the benefit um, and, and humbled to be able to sit in the seat in the position that we're in of working with schools and communities who for the large part reach out to us. And usually in order for that to have happened, they must have had some local conversation, a curiosity and or process for attaining at least initial buy-in, right? Any combination of parents, teachers, school administration or district leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I think when people think about deeper learning uh, and the, the deeper learning movement, they think of it in terms similar to manifest destiny, right? Mm -hmm. That the deeper learning approach not only is the best approach, but that um, in due time, all communities will open their eyes to its gloriousness and will have seen the error of their own pedagogical missteps. And the truth is just not true, right? An early tagline for big picture learning was and still is one student at a time. And we also subscribe to the one community at a time approach as well. Uh, different communities benefit from different learning approaches, give an equitable opportunity to pursue different approaches we know that whenever a school or community approaches us, that was the right time for them. Now, that response doesn't give Big Picture a lot of credit, I'll say that, and, and, and we're not just waiting around, but once we have the opportunity to work with a school and community, we have the chance to truly go deep with them, to find the path of least resistance, when, if, if we can get to that path of least resistance, when it comes to adopting a student, student interest, equitable approach to deeper learning. Thanks, Carlos. Lydia, given the new tech model and how, how many you have too, what would you add to that in terms of your, what's in, been enabled, what has enabled your success as a network to implement and sustain deeper learning? Um, I, I would plus one everything Carlos just said, because our two organizations, uh, we often talk about being sisters and brothers from, from different mothers and fathers. Um, but I think um, the key to having built now in 29 states, more than 200 schools is um, starting to see what it is we're trying to do for students in the terms of deeper learning, but more importantly, I feel like this moment is also causing equity to show up differently. And in the early years of the work, uh, a deeper learning model as an in-district alternative, you know, allowed for uh, districts and communities to play at the margins of offering choice. And, and this is not getting into charter versus district, but it's that idea of a little bit of choice as if that were sufficient. Uh, and now I think what really um, is a different demarcation and Anthony can speak to this for when he joined Witten Woods, which is something that's working well for some kids. Why are we limiting it to some kids? And this is deeper learning as a concept, not necessarily branded as big picture learning or new tech network, but if it's truly meeting those needs, this ought to be the new normal and how do we get there? So our conversations increasing with communities and district leaders, are the, it needs to be equitable for all students. Now, how do we get there? Not just how do we do one new tech or one big picture? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's exciting about the conversations today. We're no longer having to prove the concept that deeper learning could be achieved with the teachers you have, the building you have, the students you have, the parents you have. Like that's no longer the conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Lydia. And that's absolutely exactly where I wanted to go next, which is this notion that learning models in districts or independent schools or opt-in schools in districts, um, suggesting something of the nature that, you know, this can't be the norm for student learning in districts across the way. And so Anthony, I wanted to turn to you as a superintendent of a public school district. 
What would you say in response to that critique that this can only be done in kind of these these off one site spaces? Well, I, I don't know. Based on you know the conversation with the other panelists, um, we tried something very cavalier. I didn't know if this would be my um, first year on the job or if that would be my last day, uh, simply because we kind of flipped the system upside down. There was an opportunity to uh, create a deeper learning pathway, but it was only created for about 200 students out of a high school of 1,200. Mm -hmm. And we noticed something very, very quickly. And I know Carlos has had a lot of uh, conversations with Eric Martin, the principal. What we noticed is that those students were outperforming the rest of the student body. And we left it in that shape for longer than it should have been. Because we were, I think people were saying that we were trying to analyze it and get a lot of data to determine if it really worked. But after a few months, we saw that it worked. We just kept that same position because now we're creating another opportunity where selective parents are saying, I want this special opportunity. And, and Lydia's right. It's, it's all based on the framework of if we give it to everyone, is it still popular? And I think you could have that level of popularity and take a deeper dive, but still make sure that all kids have the exposure to take the system further than it was willing to take itself. So now we've moved it to the next level and we were offering it for, to, for all high schoolers. And now we've gone to the next level where we offer it for students in pre-K to 12. So the whole system is designed for deeper learning. And the last part of it is we've actually designed our new schools. We're designing new schools that have a deeper learning philosophy connected to them where project-based learning is embedded in the work. The schools are made around the educational system as opposed to putting kids into a system that's already designed. So we've gone full circle. We've gone as far as we could possibly go. And I think uh, with the help of, of, of you guys, maybe I turned my entire city into a deeper learning city. I don't know. But I think that it's very important for people to understand our kids come back with a different level of confidence than they've ever had before. So it, it changes, but you had to be dynamic or cavalier enough and have a group of people willing to change with you. Because in the beginning, the community fought it. They were like, well, why should we go into this process, what's wrong with the traditional learning environment? And we said that the traditional learning environment is archaic, it's outdated, and kids are not getting what they need. Mm -hmm. So we have transformed our entire system. Thanks, Anthony, that's incredible. Thank you for lifting up your example. Susan, I would love for you to chime in as well as a superintendent of a public school district. How, how do you kind of grapple with expanding it beyond just kind of one-off sites? Yeah, and I think I alluded to that before around how do we make sure that we have that that right balance of personalization and um, or customization with standardization. And I don't mean standardization by standardized tests, but again, you know, if you're in a district of any size, you know, I feel that part of my responsibility is to be able to look any parent in the eye and say, your third grader is having not the a lockstep creepy, you know, step pretty wives kind of thing where like you're learning the same thing on the same day as the kid over here, but the quality of your learning experience will be the same as a child on, across the city. You know, that's what we've got to do. Now that can look different. So, you know, one of my mentors once said is how do we guarantee consistency at the core with creativity wrapped around the edges? And so I think that for, you know, for school systems, that is that that's the balance that we're trying to hold. I will say, though, too, that and as a former teacher, um, I say this with with love, respect and understanding, um, you know, too many of our teachers are under the illusion that they're in control. And, you know, if any if, if there's any lesson, common lesson to all of us at this moment in time is that control is indeed an illusion. We control so little in this world, in this universe. And now that our students in case of Highline are learning fully remote, um, the teacher can't stand in front of the class and direct things in the way that they used to. So right. we have this huge opportunity right now to challenge ourselves as the adults and our children and families on what, what learning can look like. I mean, if ever the conditions were in place for us to do a deep dive on deeper learning, this is it. We're not going to get this again. Um, and, and I know that everybody is talking about how we have such opportunity for change and innovation out of this moment. And I want to believe that too. 
And I think that um, the muscle memory that has built up over time in our bureaucracy of public education is strong. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we need to, we're going to, it's going to be a fight. It is going to be a fight to innovate and change our public institutions out of this because that muscle memory is going to want to go back to what's familiar and what we've always known, which is fundamentally inequitable for children. Absolutely. Um, to your point, Susan, and we're going to go ahead and transition a bit to actually talking about the reality that our schools are facing right now. Obviously, COVID, ongoing displays of racial violence, um, obvious displays of systemic oppression are on full display and have thrown every a wrinkle in everything that we do and causing us to kind of reflect and move. And so um, I did want to pivot a bit to talking about kind of what this moment means in terms of challenges and opportunities for deeper learning and growing. And this aligns with many of the questions that we've been, we've been receiving from our attendees. So that's great. Um, Carlos, I want to start with you and I'm going to focus first on the challenges. Um, obviously, big picture learning has um, an interest based model that's that uses project based learning as well as kind of internship based. Really. So obviously, you need to go out into the real world. And given that that's not a reality, um, I, I someone in our audience today wanted to know how you are persisting with these kind of deeper learning approaches and learning models in the face of kind of the conditions we find ourselves in, in schools. Yeah, um, and a big cosign to everything that Susan just said. Um, I just needed to say that about the, about the fight in the moment that we're in. Um, there's a lot going on. And, uh, but I, I'd like to start, if I can, with just some success stories that also help elevate, um, or a success story that helps elevate some of the challenges. So since March, we have found that in a large number of schools in our network, uh, they, are seeing, they are seeing over 90% and sometimes 95% attendance in virtual advisories, right? And these are in communities that we know are hampered by the inequitable distribution of hardware and wireless access that we've all read about. And let's be honest that we all knew about even before we all read about it. Um, So let's look at the city of Philadelphia for for a second, where we know that in a large number of cases, schools were experiencing less than 40% attendance. And I need to say I have tons of love, admiration, and respect for Bill Height and my sister Christina Grant, who is a district administrator there. Um, and I know I know where their hearts are, and I know what work they're engaged in deeply. And we have two schools in that city: El Centro de Estudiantes and Vox High School, that haven't had this problem. And the reasons for us, at least for us, are fairly simple to discern, right? Relationships, to Lydia's point earlier, and communication. Our schools are founded on the strength of relationships between advisor slash teacher and learner, uh, between learner and mentor, which is in a professional in the, in, the, in, the work, in the workspace that they work very closely with, and between leader and parent. So there's a, there's a through line in terms of communication with all the important stakeholders that wrap themselves around our young people. Um, And because that foundation was already solid, um, the strength of these relationships were able to persevere as our schools move from a brick and mortar to a digital environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when it comes to communication, uh, we've seen in some of our schools a tireless effort to meet their communities where they are. Uh, Latitude High School in Oakland uses Instagram stories, multilingual Facebook live meetings, uh, podcasts, and good old fashioned mail uh, to meet students and parents where they are through their preferred method of communication. And just in wrapping that up, please do not get me wrong, none of this has been without challenge, but we prefer to be defined by how we and our schools have met the challenge and not by the challenge itself. Thank you for elevating those examples and agreed that we can talk about the challenges, but the opportunities and creativity and innovation that seem to be emerging in this. Um, But the other thing I'm hearing too, Carlos, is kind of leveraging some of the structures and relationships and communication lines that you've had in place has really enabled you all and young people to persist in this moment. So much appreciated for elevating that. Um, Lydia, I'd love to hear from you in in terms of how this has looked in in new tech schools and for the network in general, given your project-based learning model. Yeah, um, I appreciate Carlos, the distinction between let's not be defined by the challenge, but the response, because I think um, we take no 
solace in knowing that for our schools, they could adapt easily, quickly, and with fewer challenges than other schools in their system. So, you know, that some were able to make that switch is made possible because of the tenets of the new tech model and the approach that does include, and, and Susan alluded to this earlier, student agency, <laughs> student resolve, um, teachers as facilitators, not necessarily um, managers of the learning. And so especially for uh, middle and high school students, that switch to we used to go to the building and now we don't um, for most of the schools resulted in almost no no hiccup in in the, the work continuing and that was easier in the spring than starting in the fall um, the the biggest challenge at the moment is if we give permission for students and teachers and their families to focus on the learning and not on the, the rather contrived methods of measuring whether we're actually learning or not, we can make the most of this moment. But that means, I'll go back to the trust that Susan alluded to, it is not only trust in students, it's trust in the parents and it's trust in the teachers. And it begins with completely reimagining what it could be to be in this together rather than be in in combat um and so for us to move in this direction yes we had some technical help we use platforms people are project-based learning lends itself to this this idea of we respond to the moment so those those all help prepare our students uh learners and their families um uh, to be able to respond but it's insufficient mm -hmm. it just helped us in the moment move a little more quickly sure your point lends itself very well to another question that came from our audience that was in response to our discussion of trust and some of those kind of preconceived notions that some folks in our in our education system hold around what students and families are capable of and our audience asked how does the transition to online learning actually change this dynamic um, or has it exacerbated it or you know what effect has it had essentially on that component so um Susan or Anthony, if you will, or anybody can go ahead and field if they've if they've seen kind of how that's evolved. Yeah, Laura, I'll jump in. I, I think we we have to be very careful about uh, using the, the term transforming the system simply because this may actually give uh, people the opportunity to leave more kids behind because they don't have the technology, they don't have the infrastructure. Um, and so there'll be more excuses made. The state is making some other determinations saying that the third grade guarantee is on hold. Well, the third grade guarantee, that's a consequence simply because if the state says it's on hold, that doesn't mean you don't keep applying. You know, you'll have students that will get to that fifth grade level because you made that a void in their life for a while and the pressure won't be on. And now you'll have students having more difficulty educationally as they transition through our system. So all of these things that we have in place, we still have to keep the, the pedal, you know, pushing forward, keep the gas, moving forward, keep everything in the same direction. But my concern more than anything else is, does it give us another opportunity to leave kids behind because of the infrastructure that has not been put in, put in place? I listen to my colleagues from other school districts in, in my community, and Lydia's right. You know, we've been on our educational platform for years. Our learning management system of ECHO and the agency that surrounds it has given us a, a, a deeper dive and an opportunity to say, we have moved faster with a level of being very expeditious about how we are gonna do the work. So we've issued Chromebooks and um, hotspots and everything else for students kindergarten to 12. And we don't have that level of infrastructural damage that people are talking about, but now ours is about the sustainability. How do you keep it moving? And to make sure that new kids transitioning into the system get the same thing. Other districts are watching us very carefully and they're saying, Winton Woods is figuring this out. I'm going to now send my student, student there. But you can overpower the system simply by kids not being prepared and who gets left behind as you're trying to put, put the system into place. So it's, it sounds easy, but it's more difficult than people think because now there is a new excuse of not bringing all the students to the fold at the same time. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out to you, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Anthony. 
I, I also think that, you know, there's a lot that keeps me up at night. But one of the things is, as I view on social media and see my colleagues both in Washington state, but more commonly across the country where children are in school, um, knowing that my children here in Highline are not, mm -hmm. um, equity is going to get really real when we come out of this. It's going to get really real because I think it's just a fact that the gaps that existed before are being exacerbated right now. They just are. They just are. There's a potential that I will have children who will not have set foot in a school for a year and a half um, with varying levels of support, internet connection, food, et cetera, all of that. When we come out of this, the funding and support it will take to help those who need the help catch up is gonna be significant. And the pool of dollars will be as it always is limited. And so that means some people are gonna get less. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And, and that is not, we, we, we all have the war wounds to show how those, those battles go, right? But there will be a fundamental need for us to collectively fight to invest in and heal what is being done right now to our kids through no fault of their own or our own. I mean, it's a, you know, as a kid said to me when we were messing with their graduation last year, can't we sue somebody? And I said, oh, sweetheart, you can't sue a virus. I know it would be so satisfying, but that's the nature of where we are. So, you know, we're going to have to have some very honest and hard conversations around what we do to help our kids make up for what they've lost. Well, Susan, I'm jumping in for a minute. You're, you're, you're 100% right because Students are working off of a virtual platform. Some of them are at home. Some of them are in a blended situation. And then you have some that come face to face every day, depending on the district. Those three systems are gonna be measured against itself at some point to see which one fare the best for students. And no matter how the numbers come out, there will have to be some makeup work along the way to bring kids up to speed. And we do know based on the equity formula, students weren't up to speed in the beginning. So now you have to kind of push extra hard to bring all the students on level, but they were dealing on three different platforms at the same time and which one was right. Yeah, I'd, I would love to just say this notion of um, kind of the day of reckoning and the equity disparities becoming even more stark um, takes us to this fundamental notion of the intersection of public health and public education and really allowing ourselves to be held accountable to care about every child as if he or she or they were our own. And we don't see enough of that. We don't see enough of that in education. We tend to be very much on the, who can we penalize? Who can we sue? I appreciate that notion. There's like, somebody has to be wrong and held accountable. And if we could recognize, we got to flip that and, and recognize what we need to do and can do together. Um, but the moral imperative that was there before COVID has just uh, blown up in terms of, of actually thinking about lives and the quality of lives that are going to be lived um, uh, as we emerge. And it isn't gonna be fast. So there is some even greater need to look at this and solve in a fundamental way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lydia. Carlos, I wanted to leave an opportunity for you to share your thoughts before we close out. Oh, I was trying to give my uh, sister Lydia the last word, <laughs> um, but I, I see we have some time to fill. I, I, I guess I'll just say, let's just make sure I think if there's anything that I know that I share with my colleagues here is that we're, we're willing um, and invite everyone <laughs> to join us to be willing to make sure that we choose the uncomfortable right thing over the comfortable wrong thing every chance we get um, in order to build the necessary habit of, habits of equity and justice for all of our young people. I think that's, that's we need to keep that front and center for us. Thank you, Carlos. And we are at time. I want to say thank you to our amazing panelists for the opportunity to learn with and from you today. And thanks to all out there who attended and posed their amazing questions to our panelists. Please stay tuned if on this channel for the next session. Uh, COVID has changed K-12 forever. Meet the new leaders, which will start shortly. Much appreciated to all. Thank you very much. Thanks.